Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to be here. I've enjoyed the, I've enjoyed the conference very much so far. It's been great. Um, I would like to do my part to help move some of the blood that may still be in your stomachs up into your brains. Uh, I'm a cognitive psychologist, and what psychologists do a lot of the time is do experiments. So I'm going to start with an experiment for you guys to participate in. This is an experiment that if the clicker would work, no. Oh, let's go back. I got advanced too far. Okay, this is an experiment that asks the question, how well do we pay attention? And as Andrew mentioned, um, it involves people passing basketballs around. Now, if you've seen this before or you think you know what's going to happen, I want you to really try it anyhow and see whether you can still do it. Um, we're going to try to measure how well you can pay attention. There are going to be six people on the screen. Three of them wear white shirts and three of them wear black shirts. The white-shirted people are passing a basketball around and the black-shirted people are passing their own basketball around and everybody's moving around all in the same place. What I want you to do is focus just on the people wearing white shirts and count the number of times that they pass the ball among one another. And then at the end, I'm actually going to ask you how many passes you counted. This is going to last for about 30 seconds or so. So when I go to the next slide, uh, it should actually start and you can try this yourself. And please be quiet during this so you don't disturb other people because you have to count silently in your head. This is a, a test of attention and keeping things in mind. Here we go. Okay, now, uh, how many passes did you count? You can say it right out loud. 16. 16. Okay, so when most people said 16. Sometimes people say 15 or something like that. Okay, um, raise your hand if you saw the gorilla walk across the screen halfway through. Okay, you guys put your hands down. Now, raise your hand if you didn't see a gorilla walk across the screen. Okay, so despite all of the giveaways and everything like that, some of you still did not see the gorilla walking across the screen. Now, those of you who didn't see a gorilla walking across the screen might wonder whether there really was a gorilla there. So. Uh, if the slides will cooperate, I'm going to replay it and uh, talk over it while we, while we replay it. You'll see about halfway through the gorilla walks across the screen and thumps its chest and walks off. Now, for those of you who did see the gorilla, who are very proud of yourselves right now, um, did you see anything else unusual happen? For example, raise your hand if you saw that one of the players leaves the game and never returns. Okay, so I, I only see about, there's the gorilla, I only see about, I only see about five or six hands that I can count that notice someone le left, the, uh, left the game entirely. Now, uh, also raise your hand if you noticed that the curtain changed from red to gold during the video. Okay, now I see maybe two hands or something like that. So uh, in, in, this, uh, in this experiment, which is a, a variation uh, created by Dan Simons, my co-author of an experiment that Dan and I did together at Harvard about 12 years ago, it demonstrates the phenomenon known as inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness means when we're not paying attention to something, it can be as though we're blind to it, as though we don't even see it. It's not as though when I asked you guys about the gorilla, those of you who didn't see it suddenly said, oh yeah, there was a gorilla, I just forgot it. You really didn't see the gorilla. As far as we can tell, it doesn't really make it very far at all into your brain. And likewise, the other changes that happened in this video, almost none of you noticed, perhaps because you were looking out for a gorilla because of all the, because of all the clues. So knowing that something unexpected is going to happen or what particular unexpected thing might happen doesn't really immunize you and enable you to notice all of the unexpected things that could happen. Now, this is an example of what we call the illusion of attention. The illusion of attention is the belief we have in our heads that we see and notice much more of what's going on in our world around us than we really do. That's part of the problem that this reveals. This is why uh, people talk on the cell phone when they're driving, because they think they're paying too much attention to the world around, more attention than they really are, and they think they're noticing everything that they should, when in fact they aren't. Now, this is like a visual illusion. Um, here's the famous table illusion. Um, if you guys haven't seen it before, the trick here is that although the table on the left looks like it's much longer and narrower than the table on the right, they are in fact exactly the same shape. And if I could go up to the screen and cut it out with scissors and rotate it and lay it over the one on the right, you'd find out that they are exactly the same shape. But no amount of me telling you that is going to convince you that that's really true, or at least convince you that it doesn't look like one is longer than the other. This is a visual illusion. The kind of illusions that I'm talking about, like the illusion of attention, in which we talk more about in our book, are what we call everyday illusions. So everyday illusions are intuitive, common sense beliefs that we all have about how our minds work that are systematically wrong, 
not easy to overcome like that visual illusion I just showed you, and can get us into big trouble if we aren't aware of them. For example, they make us talk on cell phones while we're driving and get into more accidents as a result. Now, in our book, The Invisible Gorilla, um, that Andrew mentioned, we talk about the illusion of attention. We talk about several other illusions. So for the rest of my time, I'm going to give you sort of a whirlwind tour of some of my favorite ones um, from the book uh, that we talk about. So the first one is the illusion of memory. The illusion of memory is kind of similar to the illusion of attention, except it's about what's in our memories, not what's out in the world in front of us. It tells us that our memories are more perfect than they really are, and this has been mentioned uh, uh, earlier in this conference. It tells us that our memories are more objective, permanent, detailed, accurate than in fact they are. And to illustrate this, uh, first I need to call upon Captain Picard. Um, now, Captain Jean-Luc Picard was played by Patrick Stewart, and at a party that Dan Simons held once when we were in graduate school, a friend of ours named Ken told us a really funny story about Patrick Stewart. He said he was having dinner at Illegal Seafood in Cambridge, Massachusetts with one of his friends, and he happened to be seated next to Patrick Stewart, who was seated with an attractive younger woman, um, and they were having dinner, and Patrick Stewart ordered baked Alaska, which is kind of a distinctive thing to order. Uh, for dessert, and then some of the cooks came out of the kitchen and asked for his autograph, and then a manager came out and said, I'm sorry, they shouldn't have done that, that's against our policy, but Patrick Stewart was very gracious, and then he got up to leave shortly after that. And I was listening to this story, and I found it fascinating, but not for the reason you think. The reason I found it fascinating was that that story actually happened to me. <laughs> and, I had, and I had told it to my friend Ken, who then proceeded to turn around and tell it to this group that included me. Now, I immediately pointed out to Ken, of course, that that was my story because I wanted the glory of the Captain Picard story. And, and he said, oh, yeah, of course that was. You know, he suddenly realized that that was wrong. Uh, incidentally, Ken, uh, uh, was, who was a graduate student at the time, um, was studying false memories. And uh, <laughs> now this is what psychologists call a failure of source memory. That is, he got the story right. He just didn't remember the source. He thought the source was his own experience, but in fact, it was me telling it to him. And you should think about this. Um, when you hear a politician say something about his or her own past that's not true, well, it could be just a failure of source memory. These things happen to all of us. It's just that the politicians have camera crews following them around all the time documenting exactly what happened to them, and they can get caught up in them much more easily. Now, here's an even more dramatic example of the illusion of memory. We know we all know we don't remember things from you know, three, four weeks ago, like what we had for breakfast on September 5th or something like that. But what about what was happening to you two seconds ago? Let's see whether people can even remember that. This is from an experiment done by Dan Simons and Dan Levin at Cornell University. And you'll see um, this video. Uh, the guy on the left is an experimenter, and the older gentleman um, to his right has been approached as a pedestrian on the quad and asked for directions to the gym. And as he's giving directions to the younger experimenter, two other experimenters rudely cut between with a door. <laughs> and one of them replaces the first experimenter. Now, about half of the people who had this done to them did not realize they were talking to a completely different person <laughs> after the switch happened. You'll see that he actually looks at him for quite a while, and then his, has it broken to him that he's in a psychology experiment, and he's not, um, you know, and he's not noticed that he's talking to a different person. Uh, interestingly, even the people who did notice the change mostly continued to give directions afterwards. Um, now, this, uh, this video, uh, this guy, gentleman was very kind to allow this video to be used over and over again. And you can see these videos, incidentally, um, for yourselves uh, on our website, theinvisiblegorilla.com, if you're ever interested in looking at them again, and, and many others. Um, this illustrates the phenomenon known as change blindness. Um, we can be blind, essentially, to changes that happen in our world around us if our attention is not drawn directly to the change when it happens. So if suddenly I blinked out of existence and re was replaced by another speaker here, you guys would all notice because you're looking at me and you see the change happen. But even a slight momentary interruption or distraction is enough to make the change essentially invisible to us. And you might say, well, how far can we really push this? Can you change a man into a woman or something like that? Well, the answer is no. There are some things you can't do. Changing a man into a woman, a much older person into a younger person, or vice versa, uh, you know, a, a cop into a construction worker, and so on, those things don't seem to work. But the fact that those are the only things that don't seem to work suggests that in reality, we're recording and storing very little information in our memories as we go through life. Uh, if you don't need the information, chances are you're not storing it very well and reliably. And think about this when you think about eyewitness testimony and how you know, someone's getting a glimpse of someone that ran around the store you know, after, after a robbery or something like that. Well, this, was, this guy was staring at the other guy for quite a while before and after and still didn't, and still didn't get it right. So 
Uh, I'd now like to talk about the illusion of confidence, which is the third illusion that we, that we talk about. Um, there are two aspects of the illusion of confidence. One of them is that we pay too much attention to how confident other people are and use that information too much when making decisions. This is also a, a factor in eyewitness testimony and many other, uh, and many other uh, circumstances, such as people on TV who tell you what stocks to buy. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about a different aspect of the illusion of confidence. This is the confidence we have in our own abilities and our own skills and abilities. So here's an example. This is a million dollar bill. Now, I'm hoping that if I asked you guys, well, what would happen if you went and tried to use this million dollar bill to buy your groceries, you would correctly say they wouldn't cash it because there's no such thing as a million dollar bill. Well, if you, if you, would, give, if you would have given me that answer, you would have revealed yourself to be somewhat smarter than this man who flew into a rage at the Giant Eagle supermarket when employees refused to cash a million dollar bill. So someone decided he would try to pay for his groceries with a million dollar bill, it didn't work, and he got mad, suggesting that he was perhaps overconfident in his ability to carry off this crime or his likelihood of being able to pass a one million dollar bill. This is sometimes referred to as a stupid criminal story. <laughs> um, here's a couple more of my favorite examples. Um, there are some pretty stupid criminals around, but to leave your own name at the scene of the crime takes the biscuit, said Inspector Gareth Woods of the Cheshire Police. That's because a man named Peter Addison graffitied his name and wrote Peter Addison was here on the side of a building, making it very easy to apprehend him for the crime. Uh, likewise, this gentleman, who you can see on the left of this video, the, the light might not be that great here, but he said, um, uh, Lieutenant Terry Hastings of Little Rock said, I just don't know why he didn't see a uniformed police officer standing basically right in front of him. My guess is he's not just the brightest of people. The guy on the left is trying to rob the bank, and there was a cop in the bank while he was trying to rob it who just walked right up to him while he's there at the teller window. <laughs> now, what do all these cases have in common, and why do I dwell on them? Well, they're all examples of overconfidence, having too much confidence, too much faith in one's own abilities. The stupid criminals are funny, but can we find a way to test this? Now, psychologists are pretty good at devising ways to test things. I tested your ability to pay attention early with a very simple task. A um, pair of very clever social psychologists named Justin Kruger and David Dunning um, did study this phenomenon extensively. And instead of testing crime ability, which might be hard to get ethics approval for, um, they tested people's ability to tell what's funny. If they first asked subjects in their experiment, what percentage of the people that you know have a worse sense of humor than your own. So you guys might think about this yourself. Evaluate your own sense of humor with respect to all the other people you know. Dunning and Kruger then gave their subjects a humor test, which consisted of asking them to rate jokes for how funny they are. I'm going to give you one small portion of their test right now. I want you to tell me which of the following two jokes is funnier. I'll, I'll read you two jokes. The first one says, question, what is as big as a man but weighs nothing? Answer, his shadow. Joke two. If a kid asks where rain comes from, I think a cute thing to tell him is God is crying. And if he asks why God is crying, another cute thing to tell him is probably because of something you did. <laughs> this is from Deep Thoughts by Jack Handy, by the way, from, from Saturday Night Live, in case you remember that sketch. Uh, now, uh, I, I detected uh, by my informal sampling methodology much more laughter from the second joke than the first one. And in fact, the second joke um, received the highest uh, received the highest ratings in Dunning and Kruger's study. Now, how did they rate the jokes to figure out which ones really were the funny ones? They did not use the robot comedian or anything like that. Uh, instead, they had eight professional comedians rate the jokes and uh, decide how funny they were. And then they compared their subjects' evaluations of the same jokes, and they could figure out from that data whether their subjects really did or did not have a good sense of humor. So they now have two pieces of data for each subject, how funny they think they are and how funny they really are. And here's what happens when those data get plotted. The nice solid black line is people's actual perception of how funny they are. And you see that everybody's above 50. So everybody thinks they're above average in funniness. This is a typical result in overconfidence. Everybody, people on average think they're above average. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, the shaded, the, the shaded uh, diagonal line uh, indicates their actual ability. And, and the unskilled and unaware of it effect that Kruger and Dunning uh, revealed is, is shown by that difference in the bottom quartile. They're, the people who are the least funny still think they're above average in funniness, and those are the most overconfident people in their own, in their own ability to be funny. Now, okay, sense of humor is a bit subjective. Some of you might not have gone for that second joke as much, maybe even were slightly offended. I've gotten some emails about that um, <laughs> from other talks and from the book. Um, what about something where we get completely objective feedback about our own abilities? Suppose it's an objective realm where we know exactly how good we are and exactly what our chances of success are, and we all know that information perfectly. 
Well, Dan and I, along with a, a, a friend of ours who's now an economist named Dan Benjamin, did a study. And we went to a field in which everybody knows exactly how good they are, and that's competitive chess. So in competitive chess, there's a rating system which can predict with extremely uh, good accuracy how likely you are to win in any game against any particular opponent. So chess players know how good they are, and these are revealed by their rating. So we asked chess players in tournaments, what's your rating, and what do you think your rating should be to reflect your true strength, your true ability in chess? So first of all, everyone knew what their rating was, but second of all, on average, they all thought that they were underrated, meaning they thought their rating should really be higher than it actually is. This despite the fact that the ratings are truly objective predictors of performance, and the worst players thought they were the most underrated. So once again, the unskilled and unaware of it effect comes back again. We are all tend to be somewhat overconfident, but the least skilled among us tend to be the most overconfident, which reminds me of the joke about the guy who finished last his medical school class, what's he called? Doctor. Um, so, uh, keep, that, keep that in mind when you think about confidence and, uh, and knowledge. Now, uh, I'm going to go to, uh, in my time remaining, two more of our, two more of our illusions. Um, one of them uh, is brilliantly revealed, I think, by this experiment by the British psychologist Rebecca Lawson. And Rebecca Lawson did something extremely simple. She asked her subjects two questions. First, on a scale of zero to seven, rate how well you understand how a bicycle works. Now, maybe you guys can do this yourself right now as well. Just think about how your understanding of bicycles and give that a rating on a scale of zero to seven. Zero, I have no idea. Seven, I have a pretty good understanding of bicycles. That's what she asked her subjects. Then she surprised them with this question. Draw a bicycle, being sure to show the wheels, pedals, and chain. And just to help, she drew in the frame and the handlebar so they wouldn't have to worry about that part. Um, now, here's what she got. These are actual examples from her paper. Um, now, I mean, leave aside the, the, art, the severe lack of artistic skill in some of these cases and just consider whether these bicycles are actually even drivable. <laughs> look, at bi look, at bicycle, look, look at bicycle D, for example. So bicycle D has the pedals mounted to the front wheel. So as I'm driving along bicycle D and I try to turn, my, oh, I'm going to fall over like that and crumple down or bicycle B where the pedals are suspended from a little hammock <laughs> on the crossbar and have no hope of actually turning a gear and making the thing move. Now, okay, so, uh, and by the way, uh, per, uh, C uh, used a bicycle every day of her life, I believe, for transportation. Um, so uh, what's going on here? Well, um, this is difficult. Um, if you think this is hard, what about this? Um, here is uh, something that you know, some experts in our society are called upon to understand all the time. Um, this is an extremely complex structured financial product, a collateralized debt obligation um, that was uh, in some ways at the heart of recent financial difficulties. Well, the mind has enough trouble with simple concrete things like a bicycle, complex abstract things like uh, like synthetic uh, portfolios of bonds, very difficult to understand, but easy to convince ourselves that we do understand them when in fact we don't. And we call that disconnect between how much we really know and how much we think we know the illusion of knowledge. This is the illusion that we know more and understand things more deeply than we actually do, and it's especially acute in the case of complex abstract things. Now, I'd like to uh, talk about if my slides would advance anymore. One more uh, illusion briefly, and that's the illusion of cause. And this, in a way, is one of the most important ones that we talk about in our book. This is the idea that we understand it could figure out cause and effect much better than we can. I'll just illustrate it with one simple quotation that I just noticed from The New Yorker when, uh, when I was reading it earlier this year. Um, John Cassidy wrote, it is inarguable that Geithner's stabilization plan has proved more effective than many observers expected, this one included. He's referring to the Treasury Secretary's plan from 2009 to stabilize the financial markets. Now, I think the objectionable part of this sentence is one that we easily glide over, and that's proved more effective. Well, why do we think it's proved more effective? Well, because we know what conditions were in 2009, and we know that in 2010 financial conditions were better. But that does not prove that the change in 2009 caused the effect we see in 2010. Our minds are built to interpret sequences of events as the first one causing the second not to think in terms of the actual data that we might need to prove that. And the actual data is really impossible to collect. We can't randomly try all kinds of different financial plans and run a lot of countries and a lot of trials over and over again. This is what we've got. But history is sort of one long anecdote or one long story. And trying to draw significant conclusions from it can be problematic. So I'd like to, I'd like to conclude by summing up. And in, before I sum up, I'd like to say that um, I'm inspired by uh, the legendary stand-up comedy routine of Woody Allen. And at the end of his routine, he said, I wish I had some sort of affirmative message to leave you with. 
I don't. But would you settle for two negative messages? <laughs> now, I just realized I've scored a cheap laugh by using Woody Allen's material, but uh, there have been a number of negative messages in this, in this talk. We're not as good at seeing everything as we think we are. We're not as good at remembering. We're not as good at understanding ourselves, and so on. Those, it's true those are negative messages, but you can't blame me because I didn't design the mind. I'm just telling you about how the mind works. I think the positive is to think about your own behavior, think about the behavior of other people, and keep these things in mind as you make decisions. And even just as you observe events in everyday life in the news and so on, start to think about the fact that our intuitive concepts about how our own minds work aren't necessarily right, and in fact can be drastically wrong and can lead us significantly astray. And if you start thinking about that, well, one, you'll know more about yourself, and self-knowledge is the most important kind of knowledge, and two, you'll perhaps be more forgiving of other people when you see them make mistakes. You might realize that they're not stupid or ignorant, but they just have a human mind just like your own. Watch for gorillas in your midst is my six-word summary. <laughs> Thank you.